Los dejo entonces con nuestra querida invitada, Didra. Los que están parados atrás pueden acercarse. Aquí hay asientos todavía disponibles. Didra, the floor is yours. Yes. Much, dear. I have a speech deep we have to uh, just to, the advantage is it slows me down so I hope my English is it's important I think that we have the, this microphone isn't working very well about a third of the time the microphones are one of the oldest electronic technologies. And about a third of the time, they don't work. It's, <laughs> well, I hate yeah. podiums. As, as a wonderful professor you are, you hate podiums. Well, but OK. This might, might, I, might be better. I warned them of this, and it still doesn't work very well. I, OK. I'll go here instead. Now you see there's an obstacle between you and me. I want, to, yeah, I want you to believe what I say. I don't want there to be any obstacles. My, my argument, my idea, is a very old one. In the, in the 18th century, the 1700s, certain th thinkers in e Europe, part of this um, clerisy, spoke of liberalism. They invented it. And the idea of liberalism, this doesn't work either. <laughs> See, about a third of the time, is that, um, uh, th that all men and w and w and w and w with, 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 see, I do stutter. When women, dear, are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. It's true the man who wrote that in 1776 was a slave owner, um, Thomas G. Jefferson. But the idea had a force of its own. Regardless of the great and slowly eroding imperfections 
in the idea of true equality, social, social and political equality, a, a chance, as the English say, to have a go, as, Im, as imperfectly as that was realized in the, in the 18th century and even the 19th and even our century, no, nonetheless, the idea was unique to the 18th century. Uh, among its exponents were Voltaire and Mary Wollstonecraft and um, uh, um, Th Thomas Paine and uh, Adam Smith. I always cross myself when I mention Adam Smith. When I was in uh, Russia last year, when I mentioned Adam Smith, I would cross myself the other way. Um, so the 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 um, that sound. What's going on here? Why don't they turn off the damn sound? <laughs> sound is hard. Um, the the uh, um, so that idea I claim caused the modern world. Without. The idea that everyone here is allowed to open a hairdressing salon or invent a computer or start the modern university. Everyone here is able to in a way that neither the system that we came from of aristocracy allowed them to, or the system of socialism or slow socialism in regulation that we're going towards, neither of them allows people freedom to have a go. And a way of expressing this is that the, th the that the the uh, clerisy, um, this, the artists and the intellectuals, the filmmakers, rock musicians, journalists, have had in the last three centuries three ideas. One, this very good idea of liberalism, which inspired what I call the bourgeois deal. Let me, uh, bourgeois, invent um, s s something or start a new institution and allow me to test it in the marketplace, the marketplace of ideas to start with, but the actual marketplace in the end, because only things that survive in the market are uh, things that increase na na national income, national happiness is another ma matter, but the capacity, the uh, ability to live long and well d depends on a market test and can't be settled in some, in some, in some g uh, government office. This, uh, that was that idea. The other two ideas were 19th century ideas of, of the clerisy. One was nationalism in the early 19th century, which spread slowly to the whole world. And the other, in the middle of the 19th century, was socialism. So of the three, one was very good, and the other two were very, very bad. If you think you like nationalism or socialism, Perhaps you'll like National Socialism, as invented by M M M M Mussolini and um, Hitler in the 19, um, t uh, um, 20s and 30s. If you think you don't like liberalism, perhaps you'll like p p populism of the sort that Juan P Peron 
invented in Argentina, to, uh, for which the Argentinians are still uh, paying the price. A free society, a society not of equality in what you might call the French sense, not Thomas Piketty's equality of outcome, is a society in which the bourgeois deal works. The bourgeois deal, to finish what I started a minute ago, is let me invent something and I'll make you rich. Let me open a, a convenience store or start a factory and in the third act, so to speak, I'll make you rich. The problem that Piketty has is that he doesn't really understand economics, which is strange because he's an economist. He, he doesn't understand the second act of the drama of market-tested um, invention. In the second act, competitors imitate me who invented the internet or the hairdressing s salon. So it's not true, as he believes, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That old proverb, which you undoubtedly have in Spanish too, is true of the world we left in 1800. The world that we left behind when we became a little bit and then a lot liberal, allowing everyone to have a go, not having occupational, occupational licenses, not having tariffs, not having obstacles to having a go. In the economic sphere, that's liberalism. Not having obstacles to people um, voting is the version in, in politics. Not allowing fr free speech is the version that's being tried out now in Turkey and R Russia and Hungary again. So this liberalism brings the mass of people to the bourgeois deal. It, it brings them cooperating with each other. It's often said that uh, a market society is one of competition, competition, competition. No, that's not true. There's massive amounts of cooperation that goes on in a market, market um, economy. But in this second act, there is competition. There is entry. Entry is the key. Letting people have a go is the key. Without entry, with the, if you, if you admit the plausible sounding arguments of regulation, we can't, look, here, here's an example. Anyone in this room can, this afternoon, start a consulting business as an economist. <laughs> uh, maybe you don't know anything about economics. Don't worry. You're free to put an ad in the newspaper and have a little uh, sign on your door, uh, uh, George Smith, expert economist because there's no license to become an economist. I mean, you might think, well, you have to get a PhD. No, you don't. You can call yourself an economist anytime you want. But if you call yourself a doctor, a medical doctor, the police will be at your door. If you call yourself, now this is worse, a hairdresser, at least in Chicago, and you haven't been through two years of education to become a hairdresser, the, the police will be at your door. 
I'm, I'm, prob I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm morally certain <laughs> that I'm the only one in the room who could become, right now if I wanted, an apprentice electrician, beginning electrician, in the state of Michigan in the United States. That's because my grandfather, Uncle Joe, Cousin Phil, were all union electricians in the state of Michigan, and that's the only way that you become an electrician in the state of Mi Mi Michigan. Those regulations, which sound so reasonable, are simply slow socialism. We've seen repeatedly that extreme socialism of the Eastern European or Chinese variety doesn't work. There have been controlled experiments. You you mentioned the case of North and South Korea, which is the most extreme. When, when, when you showed the map from space at night of the Korean p Peninsula, at first I didn't know what you were talking about because my Spanish is terrible. But I, it, after it went off the screen, I said, oh yeah, it was that blank dark area between the island of South Korea, which is not an island, and the, and the mainland of China. That's North Korea. So it's um, the, 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 the temptation of socialism is great. And regulation, which sounds so reasonable, it sounds middle ground. I mean, we all want to be reasonable. We don't want to be fools and extremists and crazy people. So we want to say, oh, well, let's have a little regulation. But the problem is that regulation regularly gets taken over by the industry it's supposed to regulate. You're having a debate right now about Uber in um, Santiago. I hope you don't over-regulate it because it's one of these technologies that can um, improve national income, that can make people much better off. The Uber drivers go into the poor na neighborhoods. They don't stay just downtown. It's all together. Sometimes it's more expensive, sometimes it's less. But regulation of taxis around the world tends to be, I mean, almost always, I've not ever seen an exception, is in the interest of the owners of the taxi. And the owners of the taxi are usually not the drivers. And even when they are the drivers, the driver as the driver can't earn more than what an unskilled worker can, because that's what he is. But as an owner of a very expensive taxi license, he's a capitalist. And he wants to protect his capital value, which sounds reasonable enough, except you get hurt. So if we, if we go down the way of nationalism and socialism to national socialism or the moderate path of re regulation, we simply cripple this engine of l liberalism. Just a few more words. One is this word. We've got to take back the word liberalism from our opponents many of whom are my friends, and, and, and declare to them that liberalism is not the same as a reactionary conservatism. It's not, I've got mine to hell with you. That's not liberalism. You, under liberalism, under this 18th century idea, should be allowed to have a go. That means freedom of enterprise, freedom of speech. It means laissez-faire. When the French government came early in the 18th century to some people in business and said, what do you want us to do to make uh, France great again, to use an unfortunate uh, uh, locution, they said, Laissez-faire, laissez-passer. Leave us alone. That's how we become rich. 
rich, I mean adequately so. I'm, I'm, I, 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 it, we, we, we can't make the poor better off by stealing from the rich. But it shouldn't be our purpose as liberals to make the rich richer. That's not the purpose. We should say at the beginning of our speeches, and here I am at the end, saying that what liberalism is for is for poor people. I got into economics, as most economists did, to help poor people. I stay in economics because I want to go on, well, to the extent I do, helping poor people. If I ever debate Thomas Piketty, they tried to organize, the, the BBC tried to organize a debate between him and me, but he wouldn't do it. Why should he debate some uh, some professor from the United States. He, um, I, I will ask him how he spent the rewards from his book. Did he give them to the poor? I wonder. Um, the, the, the poor are not made permanently better off year by year by taking from the rich and giving to the poor. A certain amount of that as a Christian liberal I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of. We, we in this room should be paying for the education of the poor, the elementary and secondary school education. I agree with that. That doesn't mean it has to be supplied through the state. It means that we should be taxed to pay for it. So there, there should be some of this um, to transfer, but a small amount. The way to really help the poor is to have the economy grow. And the way the economy grow, grows is not through the government choosing winners. It's not through investment projects. It's not through intervention by the wise heads in parliament. It's allowing people to have a go. So I, I, I think it'll be more interesting than hearing me go on and on about this. I've written 1,700 pages on this. So we could, we could close the doors, lock the doors, and, and bring food in. And I could spend the next uh, three days reading to you these great books. One of which, by the way, has been the first one has been translated into uh, um, Spanish. Um, I, I could read them to you, and then you would truly be convinced uh, but uh, perhaps a more useful way of spending our time is, the, um, is further conversation. So thank you very much. And let's try to get a microphone that works. Does this work? Yeah. You said that you like to be close, then we can sit here together. Okay, let's okay. do it. I am wondering about oh. the sitting here. We are in a library. We're in a library, that's good. Maybe. I have, um, have 8,000 books in my house in Chicago. 8,000? 8,000, 8, and my, my, what I say is, she, my, my belief is, she who dies with 10,000 books wins. <laughs> so please, send books. send books. I'm almost there. Only 2,000 more and I'll have one. Uh, when I was seeing you talking and this idea that you don't want the podium between people and the sense of humor that you have and that you talk a lot about love. I do. Um, <laughs> it was always like that or is it because now you are a woman? I can. You can. You can use. Okay. Um, well, I my my joke is that I can't tell whether my improved economics came from getting older and wiser or becoming a woman. <laughs> and um, I, I think I, uh, being one, so to speak, 
has made me clearer about the richness of human experience in life that needs to be included in economics. And so I speak, and this is a new word, that's the, um, I speak of humanomics. Economics, we don't give up the mathematics, we still keep that, and that's very nice, but we, we add human understanding through the humanities, through philosophy, history, novels, plays, and, and, and so forth. So, uh, it, um, you know, it's the pr problem in thinking about the counterfactual. What would my life have been like if I hadn't changed gender? How would I have developed intellectually? And it's, um, I, I think I probably would have moved down the path a little bit more towards humanomics but I don't think I would have gotten all the way there. There is a uh, history that I read from you, and um, I don't know, it's true that when you came to your boss in the university oh, yeah. and announced him I'll that you, you will story. become a woman, he said, sounds I, I'll, I'll, you will tell I'll you, tell okay. The story. It's very funny. At least I think it's funny, maybe you will too. <laughs> He's, he was my dean of in, the, in the business school I worked in at the University of Iowa. And like me, he was, he's a free market economist, you know, free market, hey, free markets. And one day before I came out as Deirdre, I was in his office and he noticed that I had studs in my ear because I'd had my ears pierced because that's a lot better than having those old clips, you know, clip earrings, they don't work. But I was still Donald, dressed in Donald clothes. And I hadn't told anyone. <laughs> And he sees the studs and he says, well, what's the matter? You turned queer? In a, in a kind of, the way that men do kind of gender policing. It, 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 was, a, it was a friendly joke. He was not, he, he was actually not hostile to homosexuals or anything like that. But you know, that's what they do. And I said, well, you, do you want to hear the story? He was a little startled. So we went into his office and I, I, I told him what, what I proposed to do. This was in 1995. <laughs> and the first thing he says is, oh, thank God. I thought you were going to confess to converting to socialism. <laughs> then he said, wait, wait. This is great for our affirmative action program. Up one, down another. <laughs> and then this is not so nice. He said, ah, wait a second. I pay you a lot. I can cut your salary 70 cents on the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I knew that he was going to be my, my friend and, my, um, and, and would, would, would protect me, and he did. So actually, my tr transition at the University of Iowa was very smooth. Iowa is in the Midwest, and people think of it as conservative, and it's not. So it's, it's very easy. Some yeah. people, uh, at least here in Chile, but I think this is a very common thing, that said that there is a lot of persons that are very, uh, def that defend very much the free market economy, but yeah, yeah. at the same time they are very conservative yeah, yeah. in other matters, especially it's, moral issues. That is a problem? Yeah, it is a problem because, look, if you believe in letting people have a go in the economy, why not in the rest of their life? What exactly is the, the way that you make a distinction between freedom of uh, sexual orientation, or se in my case, gender identity, um, and uh, free speech, and all those other things, on the one hand, and the economy on the other? Look, if, if you say to yourself, there'll be some in the audience who say this, well, it's because of my religion. I'm a Catholic. I, told by my priest that uh, homosexuality is a, is, a, is a defect, is evil. Um, I invite you to look at the evidence in the Bible. The, the Bible, by the way, contains nothing about changing gender, believe me. Um, and it contains a couple of passages that have been interpreted as anti-gay, but they don't make a lot of sense as anti-gay. And if, and if you say, ah, yes, but there are those passages, three of them, actually. Three, aha, that's why I'm against gays. 
I'm, I, it's okay, they can, if they, as long as they don't say it and hide away in the darkness, then I don't mind, but if they come out, I, I don't like them. Well, then I don't know why you aren't an Orthodox Jew. There are 613 commandments of Orthodox Judaism, and this, these passages are among them. Why do you mix wool and linen? You know, what's, what's going on here? Um, another topic is discrimination, and uh, another story that I read about you was the first time that you appear in a seminar I mean, with economists as a woman. Yeah, yeah. And you say, when I gave my first idea, nobody here, someone else gave the same idea, and everybody listened. You exactly. feel that discrimination yeah. from one day to another? Well, look, if you're a woman, you're a woman, and you'd better get used to it. Um, By the way, I, you said that you were very happy that day because you that, feel like a woman. That was the first time I was happy, first and only time. What, what happened is that I was in a group of economists, and we were talking as economists do. This was in Holland at uh, Erasmus University. and, and um, uh, I was in a group of economists, all men, and they all knew about me. Um, and I was the only woman, and I, I made a point. Everyone ignored it, all the men. And every woman in this room has had this experience. And a few minutes later, George made the identical point. And all the men said, oh, George, that's a wonderful point. You should publish that. You'll get the Nobel Prize. What a wonderful idea. And I said to myself, yes, they're treating me like a woman. But that was the last time I enjoyed that experience. You know, you can't complain about it or they use the B word. Um, you, so you just have to, you know, I, I work against it. I try to support young, uh, young women in economics. I try to um, do what I can for uh, the, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a first wave uh, um, feminist, I believe in equality. And when the issue of how few women there are in economics comes up, if there's a pause in the conversation, I say, well, I did my part. And all the men get very uncomfortable and all the women laugh. The, I, everybody said me, no one asked this, but I have to ask you this. Go ahead, go ahead. Ask me anything. I'm the answer. This, you are the only person that can answer ask this question. Ask me anything. What is better than to be a man or a woman? Women, be a woman. There's no question about it. Look, 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 here's, here's, here's why. Men don't know, most men don't know about the friendship of women. Um, in my, 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 my book called Crossing, um, where I tell about the three years of my transition, I, uh, I have a list of all the women who helped me who reached out in some, sometimes minor ways, asking me to lunch, sending me a nice note. And there are f 240 names in the three years of my transition. If you went from female to male, and there are about an equal number of those, although this is in both cases a minority um, um, uh, desire, um, you're pretty much on your own. And I, you know, I was a man, and when I was a guy, I was a guy. You're, you're looking at the captain of her high school football team, and I mean American football, where you crash into each other. Um, when I was a guy, I was a guy, but, and I, I didn't understand how, how deep friendships are among women. Well. Let's talk about girls. On the other hand, I didn't do it for the advantages. It's not a career move <laughs> to change your gender. Believe me, who knows how many jobs I've been, haven't made offers to me because of my uh, gender change. Yesterday I was looking at an interview that a local channel of television was made to you in Chicago, where yeah, you yeah. live. And was something that you say in the, in the middle of an idea that focused me. You say, capitalism, I hate that word. Yeah, I don't like capitalism. It's, it's a silly word. It was invented by our enemies. Let's understand that to begin with. But that's, that doesn't distinguish it from lots of words that we adopt. Quakers, for example, the Society of Friends. The, the word Quaker, which describes this 
of the Buddhist group was because they quaked when they were when the Holy Spirit came down among them. And so it was a hostile characterization of them, but they said, okay, yeah, I'm a Quaker. Yeah, we're, we're queer and we're here, get used to it. Um, but uh, the, the word capitalism deeply misleads people because they, they then come to think that accumulation of capital is what the system is about. And it's not. It's about ideas, about new ideas. Microphones that work, that would be a nice one. Let's, let's get someone on, on that project. Maybe if um, you put it there. Yeah, no, it's okay. This works. I think people can hear me now, can they? Yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, the, 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 it's the ideas that then make the investment worthwhile. As John Maynard Keynes said, that Keynes was one of the many heroes of my youth, Marx was, and Lenin was, and then Keynes, and then gradually I shifted away from that. But anyway, uh, Keynes said in the 1930s that within a generation or two, the return to capital could be brought down to zero with um, investment if there was no innovation, if there were no inventions, no new ideas, no new ideas for a hairdressing salon, no new ideas for an internet. There would be nothing to invest in. You see what I mean? So very soon, so, so investment pouring capital into an economy, which was once the World Bank orthodoxy, is pointless. It doesn't work unless you have ideas, unless you have good, good ideas, new ideas. And they don't have to be fancy. They can be very ordinary, but they have to be new. Uh, and and, and uh, so, it, and it gr gravely misleads everyone. And me, me, my, my, for example, my, my friend Giannis Varoufakis, the former finance minister of Greece, is a friend of mine. He's nuts. He's completely crazy. But he's, but, but, but he's, he's fun to be with, and he's a very intelligent guy. I, I'm so, this is how cool I am. I've ridden on Giannis's motorcycle. That's me. Wow. But he understands the, a, a, the modern economy to be about the accumulation of capital. And it's just a mistake. It's wrong. And that's, that's why modern growth theory, so-called growth theory, is, is, is a mistake. Not human capital, not physical capital. That's not what's crucial. That's the, that's the next step once you have an idea. So what we're looking for in economics is the sources in an economy, is the sources of human creativity. That's what we need. We need to f have institutions and, uh, and societies and politics that encourage the mass of people to be innovative. And once we've got that, we needn't worry about the institutions. They'll come up, they'll be invented, or the, or the capital, that'll be accumulated. Capitalism is not about capital. Maybe, Eureka, they say that this microphone is great. I'm sure it is. It works. It, it works. works. Maybe you can have it. Oh, okay. Um, we'll see. You, we'll see. Yeah. It's, a, it's a third. Um, then, you said that you, your main concern are poor people, not rich people. You're yeah. not worried about how many houses, cars, jobs have people. No, that's right. But you are aware of poor, that's why you are an economist. Yeah. That means that income distribution has nothing to say in this, in this uh, debate. I mean, the idea of this is a party that less and less people are invited. Very, look, it's not true. The distribution of income is getting worse. I, I know you believe it. I know you believe it because they... Sorry. I, I understand that you, you, you believe this to be true because you've heard it over and over and over again. And it looks so obvious, all these rich people. But the, but the distribution of basic consumption has gotten better in the last 20 years, in the last 200 Whatever time period you take, uh, the, the uh, medical care, housing, food have all gotten better. 
Now, of course, you can complain about, I don't know, financial wealth, as Piketty does. Make his formulas, which are false. Um, and, and you say, ah, oh, we're doomed. The rich are going to get more and more wealth. But for one thing, he, he excludes, and he keeps saying it in his book without any argument for it, that he excludes human capital, which is the largest part of uh, the, the source of earnings anyway. And then out of earnings, there's consumption. Do you really care if Lillian Betancourt, the richest woman in the world, has another castle, chateau, or another yacht? I don't. Who cares? So she has another yacht. Taking away her yacht is not going to make the poor that much better off. What is going to make them better off is economic growth. We're at 3% at or 5% a year, such as in India. Uh, that, that really relieves poverty permanently into the future. Whereas taking from the rich to give to the poor, you can do it one year. Next year, the rich are not going to appear to be harvested again. It's not going to work. So uh, th this whole, this focus that his book and, and, and other developments have, have put on the front page of people's minds is, is, a, is a big mistake. Um, equality is not the problem. Poverty is the problem. Poor people are the problem. And the, th the thing is, it's very hard to do anything about equality if we're going to keep a free society at all. Um, you, we can, we can uh, we, we, we look, we can improve elementary education. I'm all for it. Let's all go and, and work for that. I'm in, in, I want uh, basic health care to be good. I told you, I'm a Christian um, liberal. But I, 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 the real problem is that there are poor people in the world. And I'm offended by it, and so should you. Those, those images we had at the, um, the, the beginning of this amazing film they did um, of, of very poor people, those three boys, sleeping on the street. That's what I want to stop. I don't care about uh, Rolex watches. It doesn't, so what? So it's stupid of Beta Kaur. She's a terrible person. She's, she's the richest woman in the world. She's endowed her foundation, hear this, with one half of 1% of her wealth. <laughs> one half of 1%. That makes her a fool, a jerk, a bad person. But it doesn't guide policy. What should guide policy is raising up the poor. And I hope everyone in this room agrees that that's what we want to do. We don't want the poor to just have scraps from our table. We want them to be educated and, and, and healthy and, and have a job. So, poor. <laughs> Save the poor. Maybe that's why you said that equality, uh, the idea of e equality is not ethical. It's not ethically relevant. Look, there are many people in this room who are more intelligent than I am. D don't, don't believe what, what has been said about how intelligent I am. It's false. It's taken me decades to get this all straight. I'm a very slow thinker. So there are lots of people much smarter than I am. So let's see, how should we achieve equality? Ah, I know. We'll take those smart people, if you'll raise your hands, please. I will, we will stick nails, pound nails into their heads until they're as stupid as I am. <laughs> How's that for a proposal? There are some people, there are many, many women in the room who are um, shorter than I am. And I wish I was shorter. So let's see how we're going to achieve that. Let's, let's cut off my feet and attach them to them so that they're taller and I'm shorter. Look, it, inequality, if you think about it economically, is the basis for trade. It's the basis for specialization. If we were all identical, absolutely identical, there would be no reason to exchange with anybody. We would have the same tastes. We'd have the same 
ideas, we'd have the same uh, abilities, and we would just sort of sit there being ourselves. But, but, but the basis for trade is this inequality. Uh, um, Chile has deposits of copper. It also has excellent wine, by the way. So those two things make Chile unusual by comparison with, I don't know, Arizona. So you can trade with Arizona um, well. So, so difference is not something that it's even desirable to eradicate. The kind of equality that I advocate, and I do, I'm an egalitarian like uh, Adam Smith, but the kind of equality I advocate you could call Scottish equality. The, the Scottish Enlightenment is against the French. Adam Smith is against um, Rousseau. Not equality of outcome, which is what Rousseau insisted in, on, but equality of, well, opportunity. Of, of the starting gate, and then it's up to you and your special abilities to find a place in the society. And again, I say, I want to emphasize this, that I'm very willing to reach down and help the poor with, say, a, a minimum income, which I think is, a, is an old uh, argument, and I'm in favor of it, a certain mi minimum income for being Chilean not for being someone special, um, uh, for, for poor people, so that they can get a start, but not a minimum wage. Minimum wages, job, job protections are great for most of the people in this room and very bad for the very poor, who don't get hired because, say, I, I know the laws in South Africa well, in South Africa, once you get hired, you can't be fired. So no one wants to hire you. So they have upwards of 60% unemployment among young people. All, Didier, um, you must concede, in fact, that all this discussion about the, f the benefit of the, freedom, of the free market came in part of the confusion that people that defend the system have made. For example, you work a lot of years in Chicago University. Yeah, 12 years. You were very close with Milton Friedman, that's right. I wasn't close uh, personally, but he was down the hallway, and you have no idea how much that inspires you. Yeah, well, that's the closest thing that I, <laughs> I have to say <laughs> about Milton Friedman. But at the same time, when, don't you think that that school and many others post an economy more cold. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the people that say that free economists cares about rich people or not poor people came from many of their conception. You know? Well, there, there is a version of libertarianism, which I call brotherly or fatherly, which is, uh, I don't care about you. If you're poor, it's your own fault. And I don't subscribe to that. I'm a sisterly li 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 libertarian, motherly, although I wasn't ever a mother. But um, so, so there, there, there's that problem, that our, um, our image is being spoiled by conservatives who just want to hold on to what they've got, and by li libertarians who take this harsh, unsympathetic line. But we as, as, as liberals need to seize back the emotional high ground, the ethical high ground. We've got to start saying, we're for the poor, and we know how to make the poor better off. You, you um, socialists have repeatedly shown that you can't. Uh, I think it's happening now in your own, in your own country here. Um, and, and we have to work against the presumption, and it's a real problem, that everyone comes from a socialist society. Everyone here was raised in a family. And families are socialist, right? Mama is the central planner. Income falls like you know, manna from heaven. It just falls down on the, on, the, um, on the family, and we don't know where it comes from as children. And as, ch as children, we're, we're 
happy and comforted. Things are taken care of. And there's a deep nostalgia for the family, which makes us think that we can do the same thing in a society of 17 million people. That we can make it a family. In Sweden, in the 19, uh, 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 on 20s, a famous politician, Swedish politician, spoke of the national home. And this phrase dominated Swedish politics for half a century. And it's, 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 you can see why people love it. Because we all want the security of childhood again. But, and it's, it's hard to convince people that no, they don't want that. They want to be adults. They want to be free, independent adults. But that's what we've got to encourage. And we, and we can't, and we have to do it in a, uh, in a warm way. For instance, I just saw an uh, excellent film called, it's kind of a chick flick, as we call it in English. The, the, the women in the room really need to see this movie. It's called, called Brooklyn. Yeah. And it's about an Irish immigrant girl who comes to the United States and finds, finds true love, but she finds autonomy as well. She finds a free economy. This is 1953 we're talking about. And by contrast with Ireland at the time, Ireland has changed a great deal since then. In contrast to the Ireland of the time, she finds the United States liberating. And that's, so she, instead of being in her comfortable home in Ireland where her mother is, where the friends of her childhood are, she ventures to the United States and, and marries a plumber. And that's, that's the spirit that we need to encourage. Um, that was a very a pretty famous movie here in Chile, but I was thinking that is still present in the United States today where you are facing an election and we have a few minutes and I want to talk about that. I, I saw the debate the other day, the first one. I, even I, everybody said Trump is a kind of crazy man. Yeah, he's a crazy I, man. I don't feel that e even Hillary Clinton represents what you're saying. What's that again? I, I don't feel that Hillary Clinton also represents what no, you're saying. she does not. But on the other hand, that doesn't make her equal to a lunatic. No, that's right. <laughs> um, to a vulgar, stupid man who has an attention span of about eight minutes. <laughs> I, you know, it's a serious job being president of the United States, and Clinton at least knows how to do it. And she's going to be a slow socialist. She's going to be a regulator. She's going to keep it. Now, it's not really going to happen because we're, we have this de deadlock in our, 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 our system. Makes it very hard to change things in a hurry. Yeah. So, but I, I, I am truly appalled, and I, and I wish Rudy Giuliani, who was on the was stage last here, year, right here. I wish he, uh, I wish he hadn't done what he's done, which is to be the one of the main spokespeople for uh, Trump. It's shameful, actually. He's a, he's an intelligent guy. He's very able at what he did when he's mayor of New York and so forth. But this is, I mean, I, I, I wish you were here. I, I, I would debate him um, because we, you know, uh, so pray <laughs> in whatever faith you have, atheism, Catholicism, pray that Hillary wins. Why do you think that Donald Trump, as you describe, as a lunatic and, I don't know, it's so popular because at the same well, time he is... He can win the election. I know he can. There's a chance. And look, this is not uncommon. I mention again Juan Perón. And if you want the United States to go the way of our, 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 our good friends in Argentina, then we'll pray for D D Donald Trump. Because it's, it's populism. It verges on fascism on the one side and communism on the other. It's really, really dangerous. The, <laughs> our great American journalist, H.L. Mencken, 
about 100 years ago said, he said, democracy, democracy, majority voting, is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. <laughs> and that's what we'll get with D Donald Trump. So no, I, I honestly, I, I'm appalled. You know, my man is, is uh, Gary Johnson. Who's a, who's a sensible guy, he's, he's, a, he's not, not a fool, he, he doesn't know about Aleppo, but he's willing to learn, whereas Donald Trump thinks he knows everything. And this is, an, it's, a, it's a dangerous attitude in science, but it's more dangerous when you're the president of, of the United States, that you aren't willing to learn anything. Uh, Harry, Harry Truman, our great post-war president, said, an expert, an expert, is someone who doesn't want to learn anything new because then he wouldn't be an expert. <laughs> That's very good. Well, uh, we are running out of time, but I, I, we will pray for your country. Thank you, you please. And you will enlighten us with your idea for our country. Okay, That's the deal. You know what the, what the people in, 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 in Mexico say in Spanish, but I can't do it. Poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.